For the first time, he is able to look into history and to sense that the garments of history are garments from which we need to diverge. We need to free ourselves a little bit from the garments of history. We need to see ourselves differently. If we do not do that, then we are closed. A predatory closure, a predatory coherence locks itself around us. And that, of course, is visible in the modern world, and I would think it's visible in novels, I mean, if you think of the trial. One of his teachers actually told him that he was going to be a writer, but he didn't immediately take that up as a career. Instead, he studied science and became a surveyor. And that was what he was doing in the rivers of the interior of Guyana. He was surveying the rivers uh, to see their potential for hydroelectric power. And he took groups of, he had a crew who went up um, the, the rivers and he, at the same time, was practicing writing. He'd already started writing poems. But it wasn't until he left to, for England um, that he actually produced his first published work, which was Palace of the Peacock. Um, that was at the time when his first marriage to the sister of Jan Carew broke down. And he then married a Scottish lady called Margaret Whitaker. Margaret Harris, and they set up house in London uh, near Holland Park, and uh, he uh, published these the series of novels. thing about uh, Wilson's uh, work is that um, although he was he, he recognized um, all of the um, problems of marginality of the place where he came from of, of, um, of Guyana he, he um, knew all about the problems of slavery and its legacies of indenture, of the coming um, colonial exploitation, of inequality, of contemporary politics, of the division of society, particularly along racial lines. These were all things that he knew about and was desperately keen to put into writing in some ways. He, he understood that these things can't be solved by simple realistic representation there must be some other way of doing something about them. Otherwise, the problem is that you, you fall into a trap of what he called predatory coherence, where um, you just get resentment for the past, uh, an attempt to change things, a reversal. 
but it becomes uh, a reversal which creates another victim. Uh, and this is something that he deals with, for example, in, in the novel Jonestown. His, his way of seeing the world reminded me of William Blake. William Blake talks about fourfold vision. Uh, there is single vision, which is the realistic world. And then there is twofold vision, which is metaphor. Threefold vision brings in the idea of emotion and fourfold vision, which creates a total picture. But the total picture is not one that you can ever actually uh, get through to. He saw it as what he called an infinite rehearsal, an infinite rehearsal, which was never complete. You're never going to get the complete end. You'll never get the, the play itself, partly because every position is biased. And you have to consume those biases. And the way that you do that is by crossing your biases with others, which you can achieve by, for example, going through nothingness, what he called the void. If you can imagine the void as a kind of um, empty space from which you can penetrate into different beings different places, different times, different universes, even. Tell me, trees, what are you whispering by Wilson Harris? It is strange standing here, beneath the whispering trees, far away from the haunts of men. Tell me, trees, what are you whispering? When I am dead, I shall come and lie beneath your fallen leaves. But tell me, trees, what are you whispering? They shall bury me beneath your fallen leaves. My robe shall be green, fallen leaves. My love shall be fresh, fallen leaves. My lips shall kiss sweet, fallen leaves. I and the leaves shall lie together, never parting. I and the leaves shall always lie together, and no, no parting. It is so strange standing here beneath the whispering trees. Tell me, trees, what are you whispering? <laughs> Savannah Lands by Wilson Harris. Lands open to sunshine and sky and to the endless winds passing their eternal rounds. Lands that hold in their bosom space like a benediction. Lands smoky with their dreams that drift across the world like memories of ancient beauty dimly recalled. Lands full of the music of birds crying softly, a vague and formless meditation to the measureless skies. When the listening cattle lift their quiet heads, dreaming their dream so solitary and wise. <laughs> Quiet Event by Wilson Harris. <clears throat> the mountains slowly emerge out of mist and cloud. This is the epitome of quiet event. When the sun, warm and filled with distant barking of dogs, rises inevitably into the mind, rises into the world, and exists beyond abstraction, beyond any attempt to ignore its objective presence so that we feel eternally alive. But beneath the trees of the forest, 
the shadow is darker than the dim hue of the mountains, which too are shadowed in parentheses and dreamlike, so that it is not strange they are wiped away like cobweb against the sky. When the mist is not parted like now to show their bare presence, their living hue of blue distance. Time, the killing and death of time, the killing and death of the mountains, the killing and death of the sun at high noon is the grave on flowering God, succumbed to the triviality of murder. Not yet is time broken, and the mountains are only obscured for a while. The sun draws a veil of heat like storm. I remember that I typed some of these poems when they were submitted to Kike Overall, and this was first published in Kike in 1955. Sun poems, tracing the sun's power and influence are the natural outcome from those who endure and delight in a kind of sun worship. Wilson Harris remarks in his book, tradition, the writer, and society, quotation, there is a school of West Indian art that idealizes the sun. I have lived for long periods in savannas, and the sun has become an adversary, one of two antagonistic principles, night and day. This collection, Sun Poems, 14 Poems in a Cycle, first published in Kaik Overall in 1955, appears two years before the Mexican poet Octavio Paz published his long poem, Piedra del Sal, Sunstone, in 1957, which is structured on the Maya calendar system of 584 days, as the author points out, for the 584 lines of his poem. In 1982, Edward Kamau Brathwaite published his own sun poem. Okay. This poem traces the poet's lineage from grandfather to father to son in the seven voices of rainbow colors and how I See the Sun, Contemporary Poetry in Anguilla, edited by Lasana M. Sakou in 2015, continues the intimate and unavoidable connection. Harris structures his collection as a cycle of 14 poems with various aspects of the sun, including a religious aspect Poem number one is titled To Christ, The Seasonless Fire. And number 14, which ends the collection, is The Intercession of Mary, Mother of God. Numbers three and four are focused on light and life, while number 13 introduces the antagonist, darkness and death. So, Sun Poems number three. Sun cuts down in the west in a knifing of wind. Light is cut deeper still, where sun rose even still. Every ship chisels the sea, and every sea planes the wind. Sun blows up in the west in a waving of wind. Light shoots higher still, where sun breathes even still. Every ship curves the sea, and every sea bends the wind. Who loves the glory of the sun must harbor its blowing light, an inward turning light that stars at the breaking of the sun. Every blank sun stays bright, where love 
still gathers a far light and fiery faint and far light beyond the eclipse of the sun, beyond the eclipse of the sun. Every day star pools the sea and the knitted sea heals the sun. For the antagonist, number 13, is the death of Hector Tamer of Horses. Over the mountains and over the sea runs a black horse. His hoof pounds the mountains and unsettles the sea. His hoof grounds the mountains like the bones of the sea. When death runs so swiftly, his black limbs remember my very vain breath and my boast in the stars. I mount him and I hold him with the sun for a saddle and a bit made of stars. I mount him and I hold him with my breath on the bridle and my boast in the stars. I mount and I hold him with my breath turning silver like a bridle of stars. Far up on the mountains and deep down in the sea, I ride my black horse up and down and far. My breath now deserts me. I spit saliva and stars. I stop breathing the gore and the mud. I grow breathless. Ride faster and ride far. My ultimate horse of darkness leaves Earth's doors ajar. I am kneaded into a star. I am kneaded in a cave of darkness where death's hoof plowed a scar. I am kneaded on the mountains near heaven where death's hoof cut a scar. Like a grave for a man and a mortal, the mud and spit of stars. The mud and spit of stars are in the mixing and in the needing of every mortal being who rides the black horse far. Wilson's novels as you would read poetry and not the sort of poetry which makes immediate sense but poetic poetry if you like um, and that's what you have to do yeah you you have to read it first of all you have to read it several times it helps often to read it aloud um, and then you have to read it backwards and forwards when you get to the end you have to read back sometimes in reverse as well looking at things backwards and then go back and you can read as many times as you want and you will always find something new in it that's also first true. my first impression of reading wilson harris was like walking through a rainforest and you you've got all these impressions of sights of sounds of smells uh, of touch and so on but you can't make much sense of them they, they just sort of come in on you from all, and then you reach a clearing possibly you know you come up a, a slope and you reach it and you can see a landscape and you suddenly make sense if you like of where you are and you think now if if everything makes as much sense as it does in this clearing this must be absolutely brilliant i just haven't understood it so far and that's how I approached the novels. Um, so gradually finding more of what was going on in the bits I hadn't understood before. Thank you. 
This was the palace of the universe and the windows of the soul look out and in. The living eyes in the crested head were free to observe the twinkling stars and eyes and windows on the rest of the body and wings. Every cruel mark and stripe and ladder had vanished. I saw a face at one of the other constructions and windows from my observation tower. It was the face of the dreaming crew that had died. So in the, in the, in the painting, I have put the crew in a little boat on the left-hand side of the, of the composition. But I left the faces, as I said, out of the windows to concentrate on the bird, which is also the palace. I was suddenly aware of other faces at other windows in the palace of the peacock. And it seemed to me that Carol's music changed in the same instant. I nudged the oracle of my dreaming shoulder. The change in variation I thought I detected in the harmony were outward and unreal and illusory. They were induced by the limits and apprehensions in the listening mind of men and by their wish and need in the world to provide a material nexus to bind the spirit of the universe. It was this tragic bond I perceived now as I had felt and heard the earlier distress of love. I listened again intently to the curious distant echo and a dragging chain of response outside my window. Indeed, this was a unique frame. I well knew now to construct the events of all appearance and tragedy into the vain prison they were. A child's game of a besieged and a besieging race who felt themselves driven to seek themselves first, outcast and miserable twins of fate, Second, heroic and warlike brothers. Third, conquerors and invaders of all mankind. In reality, the territory they overwhelmed and abandoned had always been theirs to rule and take. The windows of the palace were crowded with faces. I had plainly seen Carol and Wishrock, and now as plainly I saw Cameron, the adversary of Jennings. I saw as well the newspaper face and twin of the De Silvas who had vanished before the fifth day from Mariella after making an ominous report and appearance. The music Carl sang and played and whistled suddenly filled the corridors and the chosen ornaments of the palace. I knew it came from a far source within, deeper than every singer knew and Carl himself was but a small mouthpiece and echo standing at the window and reflecting upon the world. In the rooms of the palace where we firmly stood, free from the chains of illusion we had made without, the sound that filled us was unlike the link of memory itself. It was the inseparable moment within ourselves of all fulfillment and understanding. Idle now to dwell upon and recall anything one had ever responded to with the sense and sensibility that were our outward manner and vanity and conceit. One was what I am in the music, buoyed and supported above dreams by the undivided soul and anima in the universe from whom the word of dance and creation first came the command to the starred peacock who was instantly transported to know and to hug to himself his true invisible otherness and opposition, his true alien spiritual love without cruelty and confusion in the blindness and frustration of desire. It was the dance of all fulfillment I now held anew deeply canceling my forgotten fear of strangeness and catastrophe in a destitute world. This was the inner music and voice of the peacock I suddenly encountered and echoed and sang as I had never heard myself sing before. I felt the faces before me begin to fade and part company from me and from themselves as if our need of one another was now fulfilled 
and our distance from each other was the distance of a sacrament. The sacrament and embrace we knew in one muse and one undying soul. Each of us now held at last in his arms what he had been forever seeking and what he had eternally possessed. I use the image of Cristo and the jaguar skin because it reminded me of the, the concept of the were animal, like the were wolf and the were jaguar. So for me, the Makanaima spirit, jaguar skin, that to me in my mind was like a were, a were jaguar of the of the Guyana forest. One day it would become the legend of the new school of the heartland. How oh, Christo had killed Abram's tiger and the lovely striped feminine skin of the devil was the coat he now wore wherever he went. He had shot the lurking brute above the headwaters of a tributary, had dried and treated the beautiful skin until it was perfect and had donned his new colors on the very night of the week. Madga had delivered his summons and letter to a crushed Sharon, half bemused and pierced utterly by the full burden of events. He unwound a length of rope from the tree stump to which his dinghy had been moored, seated himself in the stern, and with a deft movement propelled and paddled the nervous craft into the grasp of the tide. The torn skin of the water began to hiss, and the bones of the river acquired a new threatening disposition, chained within the uneven moods of the sky. The open reflection of the landing was fast turning into a jagged accumulation of elements, half air, half earth, vegetation and shadow and stone, all staggering to make a larger, more solid, still unearthly presence than ever before. A hanging profile materialized at last and Stevenson glided upon a giant suspended tongue, 75 feet wide, licking the opposite bank of the river and leaving a delicate bubbling trail along a continuous knife edge of leaves. At last the eternal tone of the falls seemed to slice into his own heart and volume so that it was possible for one to distinguish in the echoing roots of the forest a clear and yet profound trailing note and Stevenson strained his attention to catch the disembodied branches of hiss and roar, the strange aerial sublimations of bitterness and cruelty apprehended vaguely time and time again in numerous often abrupt veins and shades of sound across mediating distances. I had now arrived at the weather beaten on painted slum of an old three-storied house with a sign above the door. Lodging house, M. M. Frederick Brothers. Pinned to the sign was an announcement by the All Boys Town Old Glory African Masquerade Band. 
which was to perform on Boxing Day, a limbo parade throughout the streets with masked dancers on stilts celebrating the buried past. Hope had told me he had a couple of rooms on the ground floor of the lodging house overlooking the road and that he lived here when he happened to be in Georgetown. I had never had urgent occasion to look him up before. He came to the door when I knocked in tattered trousers and vest, looking quite startled when he saw who it was. Perhaps he was ashamed of the old ghost of a house, the womb of light in which he stood. May I come in? Sorry to knock you up, Hope. My voice rasped across the room like a command. But there is an urgent matter I wish you to attend to. I have some requisitions here for materials and stores which you must deal with immediately after the Christmas holidays. I would have passed them on to Mosley, but he's in Buxton today. And remember, you must run up the entire crew and get them to report on the 2nd of January, not a day later. As I spoke, Rath coughed the wall on my right hand in the gloomy cell of the room. After the glare of the sun suddenly shone like a burst of animation, ammunition towards my chest. It was a curious conjunction of spirited breath on one hand, in one eye, and breathless weapon, gunfire in the other, that lay just under the threshold of time, like an imprint that faded the very moment it arose. The doctor in the state hospital rubbed the dead king's arm with a piece of cotton wool, offered him a drink, and then, seeing how little affected he was by the bloodletting ritual, ventured to ask him whether he, as a prince of the estate, would take the lead in signing petition. What petition? asked Masters. I need cadavers, said the doctor bluntly. Freely donated. Sign, please. Masters was not sure that he had heard aright. Whose cadaver, he asked. He was drawn to the devil's fire. He was drawn by a lust for purification, yet he shrank away now within a confusion of place and mind, heart and soul, science and religion. Whose cadaver, the doctor repeated. Why, yours, of course. Sign here, and I will give you a card mark atonement. Keep it in your pocket as a, your good deed to the state. I shall then be able to claim your royal frame in collective installments, the state's kidneys, the state's lungs, the state's blood bank, the state's everything. He shook master's shame. No, no, I'm sorry, the dead king cried quickly. No. What? What? Don't you see that if you, a prince of the state, gave your frame, it would inspire millions? They would give their souls, the devil confessed. Masters felt guilt. He had given royal blood the royal sweat of industry, the royal guilt of industry. He had given all these, but his compulsive desire to marry or to wed fire created a terrible beauty in parallel with a terrible danger. And as he resisted the devil's temptation, the fire retreated a little into an organ of mystery that overruled all blind gift of body or soul before or after death in the name of pure science or in the name of pure religion.
we came upon a procession of miners who had arrived from the Mazaruni. Did they too bear shadows? Were they the involuntary genius of a history of conquest? The fact was they had sweated like devils for gold and diamonds in the gold and diamond fields of the Mazaruni. They had been impregnated by black gold dust or golden black legends of ruined El Dorado. I felt sorry for them. Perhaps if I had struck the ground with my serpent stick, they would shed the load on their backs and become ordinary males again. As it was, however, they were burdened as much by the grave of El Dorado as by the fetus of wealth. This extract is, is the very end of what I regard as Wilson Harris's masterpiece, Jonestown. In Jonestown, although it's based on the Jonestown tragedy um, that happened in Guyana, um, there is very little about the actual um, events, but it is an attempt to show um, how that is actually an image for all sorts of other tragedies and catastrophes that have happened uh, all through the ages. Um, and it's also an attempt to bring together a lot of different images, books, ideas into what Wilson called a memory theater in which he actually shows um, uh, how all of these things can be related to each other. It's been, the main character is uh, somebody called Francisco Bone, who is Jones's uh, left-hand man. His right-hand man is somebody called Deacon. Uh, Deacon has made a pact with the um, people or spirits on the mountain of Roraima, um, but he has broken it. Bone has been given the mask of Deacon, so he looks like Deacon. And when he is taken to Roraima, he is treated as Deacon. I am not Deacon, I cried for the last time in the play. Who then is to be tried and judged, if not Deacon? Who? Does no one claim the part? Is everyone innocent? No one guilty or responsible? I was still. I was a mere colonial, not an imperialist. My limbs had aged nevertheless under the burden of eclipses of memory. Are colonials the only potential creators of the genius of memory theater? I was weak, but I had gained the other side of the dream. Who then are we to judge? Judge me. I said at last, I am here before you. I have nothing. I am poor. Judge me. It is no accident. They took me without further ado to the edge of the cliff. The sun was still high, though setting on the skin of the predator. It shone there. It was imprinted there. It was alive. It fell with me, the predator fell with me, when their hands, the judge's hands, drove me over the edge of the cliff. Blackout music, black soul music, I fell into a net of music, the net of the huntsman Christ. The predator peered through me, in me, but was held at bay in the net. We stood face to face, dread and I, Predator and I, old age and youth, parted, and I was naked in the lighted darkness of the self. The child rode on the predator's groaning back. Lightness becomes a new burden upon the extremities of galaxies in which humanity sees itself attuned to the sources and origins of every memorial star that takes it closer and closer however far removed, to the unfathomable body 
of the Creator. Um, in in all of Wilson, Wilson's novels, there's always an artist being mentioned. And um, this is also the case of Mittal Alza, which is very rare because other West Indian novelists never did that. And this, in this, this particular novel, The Mask of the Beggar, the artist is the protagonist throughout. It is the quantum miracle, sleep and awakening mother and son become equals, though diverse in their roles of a creating God, taxed to extremity, and a mother of art or symbolic sculpture and painting of flesh. They speak for me and my son within parallels of difference and engagement across seas and lands. They speak for an imperiled mankind divided in itself without an appreciation of the chasms they should cross to find the origins of life. Guyanese landscape was always somewhere behind all of them, right through until the final novel, The Ghost of Memory, uh, which is about a man who is shot as a terrorist, although he is not actually a terrorist, and falls into a picture in a gallery in a great city, which is uh, a good description of the kind of dream scenario we find in a lot of Wilson Harris's novels beginning. And his last novel was the one that defeated me. But um, I will get back to it. I have to find an image for that one. I think it's perhaps his most complex. People were jumping in and out of, of picture frames, jumping across space and time. It was, it was hectic. Painting for me too is a reference to the people, the, the pork knockers of the Majruni, you know, the diamond, diamond seekers who live on the riverside and dive into the river looking for diamonds. And so there's also another little boat on the, um, on the top of the horizon on the left hand side. Yeah. I set out along the river on a wave of land. Was it water or land on which I walked? The wave blurred my eyes. I felt awkward and uncertain of who I was and where I was. My bones, which had fallen apart when I fell, came into me from ditches sparkling with diamonds that turned into a shining fish. Imagine a diamond fish drowning in air. I had jumped to the water in the river, but had been caught and held in a net. It fluttered like a living machine. Was it alive? Had it drowned? Was it dead? 
Such is a work of art, caught like me. What, what one is saying is that at times of great change, which may foreshadow some kind of rehabilitation, there may be two forces at work in the world. One seems to be a devastating force. And yet, running close to it is another concept of survival, of miraculous preservation. And if we neglect that other force, that, that miraculous preservation, we may lose the whole thrust of creativity if creativity becomes simply a realistic presentation of what is happening in the world. One may neglect something so subtle and curious that runs with it, in parallel with it. And it is there, I think, that this measure of rehabilitation resides. We tend to overlook what a concrete presence the survivor is. We place all the emphasis on the catastrophe. But the survivor, why he survives, how he survives, may be of immense importance. And it is the creative imagination that has to excavate that situation, to come abreast of the importance of that survival. Unless we understand this, how can we rehabilitate our world? Because there is a paradox of forces in forming each construct or each structure. But that paradox is of immense importance. If we are to rediscover some ground of genuine hope, in other words, if we nurse perverse hopes, we are doomed. But when those perverse hopes crack, the perverse hopes, when they crack, we become hopeless. We say, well, you know, it's gone. But it has not gone. In fact, that hopelessness is sliced and sliced and sliced again. And then a kind of genuine hope comes into play. Once again, this theme of re infinite rehearsal. There is no final play to which one could attach oneself. Mm -hmm.